All right, we'll get started today, and believe it or not, we're going to start the, the very last chapter, chapter 9, in today's class. Um, I will uh, fill you in pretty soon via in class and on Blackboard. Um, on the final, on the review schedules for the last two exams, they're all kind of packed together, as you guys know. So usually the, the way it should work is we'll have a regular exam three review, which will be uh, next Friday. I'll have the files for that posted by the end of this week and details about that. Same room as last time, two doors down. Um, so that, that exam review will be pretty much following the normal pattern. And then for the final exam review, typically the way it works is we'll do it in three parts and we'll do two parts in class the last two days of class and then one part will be a separate session on friday although not as long as a, a normal exam review so we're on i think we're on track to do that so that requires that i finish all the course material obviously before we can start reviewing for the final but we should be on track for that and again i'll have details about the intended schedule as we get closer to that so that's all coming up soon because we're getting very close to the end of the course now what i want to talk about Today, before we start the material, is um, occasionally I like to check myself and make sure I'm not talking nonsense to you guys. So um, I've been saying all semester the importance of doing all four homework attempts. So what I wanted to do was sort of analyze, at this point in the course, we're almost halfway there in terms of the number of points earned and, and way, way more than halfway there in terms of the time spent on this course. And just break down the students into two groups. Those who have done all four homework attempts every week, which is my sort of baseline request for effort in this course, and then those who have not. And really, it's a, it's a really sharp cutoff. So even somebody that did all four homework attempts every week except for one, like they're, they're in the second group here. So it's, it's you know broken down in a pretty crude way. Um, there was, I think, 10 homework assignments at the time that I analyzed this data. So if you did all 40 attempts, you're in this group. If you did 39 or less, you're in this group. So right now, 18% uh, of students have done all four homework attempts every week. Um, so roughly one out of six of you are, are following my directions. Uh, and their average on the two exams is, uh, is 69, and, and that get, correlates to a, a grade when you factor in a homework and everything of a B minus. Um, and about 18% of those students are in danger of failing. Um, if you look at the students who have not done all four homework attempts every week, that's 82% of you, the rest and their exam average was 61 percent so about eight percent lower and that leads to an average grade of c for that group and about 38 percent of them are in the df range in danger of failing so i did a t-test on these two groups to make sure this wasn't just statistical noise and there is a very significant difference between them based on the p-value any of you that taken stats before kind of know what that means so this is not to say that doing all homework attempts every week is a is the magic bullet that's going to make you do well in the course but it's so it's not really a cause and effect sort of situation it's just that doing all the homework attempts is a sign of the regular effort that you need to succeed in this course and it's sort of at, again at minimum something that you should be doing to try to keep up so we're we're kind of late in the semester but it's never too late to change your habits and as you can see here those that have had good habits this whole semester are doing significantly better than those who have slacked off a little bit so that's just a, a little bit of that so i think it it is important of course it's not the only thing you can do but it do, this does show that there's some relevance to what i've been saying all right on to the material today so we're going to talk in chapter nine all about what are called condensed phases so these are the other two phases besides gas we talked about gases in chapter eight the whole time now we're talking about liquids and solids and one of the key differences here that's going to be important as we get into this part of the course is sort of putting aside one of the key assumptions that we had from kinetic molecular theory. So kinetic molecular theory was pretty much the last thing we did in chapter 8, and it was talking about the, the properties of atoms and, and molecules in the gas phase that lead to their ideal gas behavior. And one of the assumptions in order for something to behave in an ideal gas is that the particles, the atoms and molecules that make it up, have no interactions with each other. So that was a key assumption of this. There were other assumptions as well that they take up no space, but the important one that sort of distinguishes ideal gases from either real gases or condensed phases, liquids and solids, is this idea that ideal gases we assume have no interactions with each other between the atoms and the molecules, but in reality that's not going to be true for any real gas as well as what we're talking about in this chapter, liquids and solids. And so what happens is that you know atoms and molecules are in constant contact with each other, particularly true in liquids and solids they're they're sort of always in contact they're not moving around freely through space like you think of for a gas 
And then what we have then, and, and what's responsible then for holding the atoms and molecules together as a liquid or as a solid, is that you have these sort of interacting forces, these forces of attractions that hold them together. So we're gonna talk about the different types of those forces, how to predict which substances have which types of force and how strong they are and all those things. So um, we're gonna get more details on this, but this is the key idea we're gonna start with in this chapter. You have these interacting forces between atoms and molecules that hold them together in the liquid or solid phase. All right, so again, the key assumption of gases is that they're zooming around. They're not really interacting with each other. They might bounce off each other from time to time. But in liquids and solids, the atoms and molecules are sort of constantly in contact. And in, in liquids, they're rolling over each other. They're flowing, but they're always in contact with each other. In solids, as we'll see, they're pretty rigid and held in place in a, in a tight arrangement. But it's these forces that hold them together, either as a liquid or a solid, and prevent them from just flying apart like they do in the gas phase. All right, so we're going to start defining what are called intermolecular forces. Now, in order to fully understand this, it's helpful to know a little bit of Latin. So inter means between. When you're talking about something that's between two different objects or two different species, you're talking about intermolecular force. And so that's what this refers to. It's forces of attraction. between two molecules, or more generally, two particles. And we're gonna mostly talk about molecules in this part of the course. I'll spell the word two eventually. So between two molecules, or it could be between two atoms, so more generally between two particles. Um, but we call it intermolecular forces usually because that's sort of the context we usually talk about it is forces between molecules. But when you're talking about intermolecular forces, it always takes two or more to tangle. You're always talking about the force between two different molecules or two different atoms that are not bonded to each other. Now, we have to make sure that we keep this straight from other types of forces we've learned about already in this course. So the main type that we learned about starting back in Chapter 3 was bonds, ionic bonds, covalent bonds. Intermolecular forces have nothing to do with that. So if you're talking about a chemical bond, which would be either an ionic or a covalent bond that holds two atoms together, that's not going to be an intermolecular force. That would be called an intramolecular force because it's within the same unit or same molecule. And so it has nothing to do with bonds and it has nothing to do with covalent bond strength. So one thing we have to be careful about is when we're making predictions about the strength of intermolecular forces, we don't sort of slide back into what we did earlier in the course and talking about covalent bond strength. Remember that any type of bond are intramolecular forces. So again, knowing a little bit of Latin is helpful here. Intra means within. So an intramolecular force is a force that holds a molecule together, a single molecule together, whereas intermolecular forces are forces between two or more molecules that hold that collection of molecules together in the liquid or solid phase. So to make sure we keep this straight. We're no longer talking about bonds anymore. We're talking about just forces of attraction between two different molecules. And on top of that, as we'll start talking about today, these forces, intermolecular forces, are much, much weaker than covalent bonds or ionic bonds. So they're, they're relatively weak, um, but they are still responsible for the behavior of substances when they're in liquid or gas phase. All right, so that's gonna be a little bit of a background on intermolecular forces before we more formally define them later on. Um, but what I also want to give you a quick introduction to our phase changes because a big part of this chapter and a big thing that's important with these intermolecular forces is understanding how substances change between the three states of matter, solid to liquid, liquid to gas, and so on. Um, and so the two main ones we're going to talk about, there is a third one that we'll encounter a little bit later on. I guess I could try to introduce it here quickly. But the two main ones are the conversion between a liquid and a gas. And there's kind of two different terminologies associated with this, but typically if we convert something from a liquid to a gas, we refer to that as boiling or vaporization. It really depends on the context usually. Um, vapor, gosh, I can't spell today or any day. So boiling and vaporization are the process of converting a liquid into a gas. Usually, we, you know, they don't mean that much different in terms of what they actually mean, but normally in context, boiling means you're heating something up until it goes from liquid to gas. 
Vaporization is often just referred to as sort of the spontaneous process of that happening, like evaporation, as we saw names call it too. So they kind of mean the same thing, so don't worry too much about distinguishing them, but they both refer to the process of converting the liquid to a gas. And then the other direction, when we go from gas to liquid, is called condensation. So we're just introducing the terminology first, so when I use it later on, we're not confused by that. And we're going to give a more precise definition for this later on, but it is helpful to still know it in general terms, which is the boiling point. So when you're heating up a substance, this would be the temperature at which the liquid and gas interconvert. And there's a more precise definition, as we said, that we'll get to later on. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that these phase changes are totally reversible, meaning that if we heat a liquid to the boiling point, it will convert into a gas. Or if we take a gas and we cool it down to that same boiling point, it'll start to convert back into a liquid. So it goes in both directions, um, and that's what, that's what this is sort of showing here. Now the other one is liquid to solid. Um, and so this one is called freezing, which you probably are familiar with, although not as familiar with in Houston as you would be in other parts of the country. So that's when we go from liquid to solid. And then the other opposite direction is called either melting or fusion. Fusion is sort of the more technical term, but melting is often used as well. All right, so that's the conversion between liquids and solids. And so then what we call either the freezing point or the melting point, it's called both things, but it's the same temperature that it refers to, is the temperature at which liquid and solid is interconvert. All right. And so the reason we're starting to introduce these in very general terms right now is the key correlation we want to be able to understand as we introduce intermolecular forces is that if you have stronger intermolecular forces, which again are those forces between atoms and molecules in liquid or solid phase, we're going to abbreviate them as IMFs, not the International Monetary Fund, but intermolecular forces. And when you have stronger intermolecular forces, that's going to correlate with a higher boiling or freezing point. So the one substance we're already familiar with, water, has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius and a freezing point of 0 degrees Celsius. That's sort of how the Celsius scale was designed, was around those temperatures. And if you want to, if you want to find if a substance has a higher boiling point than water or a lower boiling point, you need to understand whether the intermolecular forces in that substance are stronger and weaker. So that's the key determinant of where those temperatures occur. So we're going to learn how to compare intermolecular forces at sort of a, a relative level, and then that's going to correlate then with these temperatures at which the substance would either boil or freeze. All right, so any questions on that so far? All right, the most important thing we're going to cover at the very first part of this chapter are going to be the different types of intermolecular forces and then understanding how to predict which substances would have them. All right, so the first one we're going to talk about are called London dispersion forces. Um, and so what types of compounds have London dispersion forces? Well, this is something that everything is going to have. So any substance that has electrons, which is any substance on planet Earth is going to have these London dispersion forces. So this is the intermolecular force that is always present in any substance. And what it involves, this one's not the easiest to sort of understand conceptually, but I'll, I'll try my best to give you a little bit of a background of what it involves. Mostly you're going to have to just be able to predict which substances have this, which is all of them, and understand later on how the relative strengths of these different forces, but instantaneous dipoles are sort of what are responsible for this. All right, so what do we mean by instantaneous dipoles? So what is that referring to? So the way that these forces work is that if we have 
let's just say we're going to do it just for an atom right now. Let's just do two helium, helium atoms. So as we know, the electron density in helium is spherically distributed around the atom. The valence orbital is a 2s orbital, sorry, 1s orbital for helium. And that's a spherically shaped orbital with two electrons in it. So all the electrons in helium are going to be perfectly spherical, perfectly isotropic, no sort of unbalance of charge in that. So each helium atom is going to have this spherical distribution of electron density around it on average. But what happens is, as we learned back in chapter two, when we talked about quantum theory, just because the electron density is spherical doesn't mean that the electrons are always in that exact same region. Remember that we defined this in terms of probability. So at some instant in time, the electron density could be a little bit distorted in helium atoms. So it's not always, because remember that these, these atomic orbitals don't define exactly where the atom, or sorry, where the electron is. It's not moving in a circle or held in place. It's a wave function. It's a probability of being in a certain place. And so at some points in time, there's a probability of the electron density being a little bit distorted off to one side or the other. And so what that means is you have these what are called instantaneous dipoles. The electron cloud gets a little bit distorted, so we're putting the nucleus there. It's distorted, and so you have a region of partial positive and partial negative charge that's unequally distributed around the nucleus if this happens. And then what that can do is that can induce a dipole in a neighboring atom that's going to then attract to it in the opposite direction. So these are sometimes referred to as induced dipole forces because there's a small probability of the electron density being unequally distributed. And then when that happens, that's going to force another atom nearby to also have an unequal distribution of electron density. And they're going to attract to each other through those opposite charges. And then, but this is not a static picture. It's not like it's just staying like this all the time. These electron densities are constantly fluctuating, constantly, um, you know, moving around. And so then it's going to, some period of time later, it's going to distort in the other direction. And then it's going to attract to another atom that's distorted as so. So these are not static permanent dipoles. These are not permanent dis un unequal distribution of charge. It's that the charge is sort of fluctuating around. And at brief instance in time, there is this unequal distribution that leads to this attraction. So that's kind of what it looks like. In molecules, it's going to be very similar. So let's say we have a nonpolar molecule, bromine, Br2. So because this molecule is totally nonpolar, the two atoms have the same electronegativity, we would expect on average the electron density to be evenly distributed around the molecule. So I'm going to draw this as sort of a oval-shaped electron density that's ideally equally distributed around the whole molecule. Second bromine molecule, same story. So on average, there wouldn't be any net interaction between these molecules because the electron density is totally symmetric. There's no dipole. There's no partial positive or partial negative charge anywhere to have that force of attraction. But just like the same thing that happens in helium, because of the what's called polarizability of the electron density, the fact that it's not static and stuck in place, but it's sort of, you know, oscillating around a little bit. At some instant in time, what you might have, I'm going to try to draw this in an exaggerated way, is this unequal distribution of electron density, where let's say at some period of time, the electron density is more distributed over on this side of the molecule, leading to a partial negative and partial positive charge, and then that can interact with another bromine molecule that's polarized in the opposite direction. So again, unequal distribution of electron density. And as I said, this is not static, so they're going to sort of fluctuate and oscillate over time, average out to be no dipole. But at brief instances in time, you're going to have these different distributions of electron density that result in these very small dipoles, but nonetheless significant enough to hold the molecules together. Br2 is a liquid at room temperature, so these forces are fairly significant, even though it's not a permanent dipole. So again, unequal distribution of electron density, opposite sides line up, and they sort of attract to each other. So it's, that one's not the easiest one to picture because it, re, it re, sort of re, requires you to remember that these electron densities are not static but are, are fluctuating around or based on sort of a probabilistic distribution from the wave function. But it, it's sort of just a force of attraction because of this brief period of time when the electron density is unequally distributed. But the point is all molecules have – 
London dispersion forces, all atoms do as well, like, like helium, for example, is just an atomic substance. They all have this type of force because in every substance that has electrons, the electron density is going to be fluctuating around and not going to be symmetrically distributed at all points in time. All right, so that's what a London dispersion force is. Probably more important for you guys to understand is how to compare how strong the London dispersion forces are. Um, and so there's sort of two main factors that influence the strength of those London dispersion forces. Are they, you know, comparing two substances, is it stronger, is it weaker? So let's look at the noble gas series. Those are, again, all just monoatomic substances, just atoms in the, in the, you know, collections of atoms that make them up. And so we have here the noble gases. Let's, let's look at the boiling points of the noble gases. Because as we said, the boiling point is going to correlate with how strong the intermolecular forces are. If the intermolecular forces are stronger, then the boiling point is going to be higher. And these substances only have London dispersion forces. That's the only type of intermolecular force they have. So that's going to be responsible for any difference in boiling points between them. So if we look at helium, the boiling point for helium is 4 Kelvin, extremely cold. If we go to neon, it increases to 27 Kelvin. Argon is 87 Kelvin. Krypton, 121. Xenon, 165 and radion, radon 211. So room temperature is about 298 Kelvin, so these are all going to be gases at room temperature, and they're called noble gases for that reason. But we do see that the boiling point changes pretty dramatically as we go from the lightest one, which is helium, to the heaviest one, which is radon. So one of the chief determinants then of London dispersion forces, because this suggests that the London dispersion forces are weakest in helium, strongest in radon, and they sort of increase systematically as you go down the column towards heavier and heavier noble gases. And this is telling us then that London dispersion forces are stronger when there's more electrons present. So when there's more electrons, or when, we, when the atoms or molecules are heavier, as we often say, higher atomic mass or molar mass, that leads to stronger London dispersion forces. And hopefully that makes a little bit of sense with the picture I drew on the previous slide, because these London dispersion forces require the electron density to distort, and if you have more electrons, they're going to be held in a bigger space. There's more chance for them to distort and cause that unequal distribution of charge. Whereas if you have very few electrons, they're going to be held more tightly close to the nucleus, not have as much ability to distort around the nucleus. So the more electrons you have and the further away they are from the nucleus, the more distortion you're going to have and the stronger these forces will be. And so what this basically correlates with then is the London dispersion forces correlate with how polarizable the molecule or the, or the atom is. So polarizability is the ability of an electron cloud to distort. So when we say how much can it distort, well that's called the polarizability of that substance. And it's also important to realize that as we talked about back in chapter two, the outer electrons are held less tightly, the ones that are further away from the nucleus, because they're, they're further away, they take up a larger volume of space too, the, the probability of finding them is further away. And so those outer electrons are less tightly held in lar large atoms, so that's why the heavier atoms are more polarizable and have higher London dispersion forces. Now the other factor that can that controls polarizability, which I want to briefly mention because I think it might come up on one of the homework questions you might get, so I don't want to leave it aside completely. Most of the time you're just going to be comparing, you know, the atomic mass, molar mass. The ones that are heavier have stronger London dispersion forces, it's as simple as that. But the other thing that matters too is the for, for molecules in particular, atoms are all roughly spherical, of course, but for molecules, the shape of the molecule can matter as well. So you can have two things that have the same chemical formula or, or very similar chemical formula, same molar mass and everything, but they have different polarizabilities because of their different shapes. So as, as a classic example of this, 
let's look at the compound C5H12, which is called pentane. And so this as something you'll learn more detail in organic chemistry, but this has different what are called isomers, different molecular structures that have the same formula. And so one of them looks like this. I think this is called neopentane. These all have special names that I'm drawing a blank on because I'm not an organic chemist anymore, or never was. But um, anyway, there's one that looks like this. So the five carbons are arranged like that. We have one in the center, four around it. Um, but then there's another one. <laughs> well, there's a lot of these, but there's the, another sort of extreme would be where they're all arranged sort of in a linear fashion. So you'd have a chain of five carbon atoms terminated by hydrogen. I'll draw those all in explicitly here. So these two have exactly the same chemical formula, exactly the same molar mass. So you wouldn't be able to predict just based on that which one is more polarizable, which one has stronger London dispersion forces. But the one that's sort of a flat chain like this, the molecules can pack together better. They can stack a lot closer to each other. They have a larger area of contact when they stack versus this one, which is almost like a spherical shape almost. And so this one is going to be higher London dispersion forces or more polarizable. One that has the linear structure because it's able to lie flat with each other, they can pack together really tightly, have a larger area of contact. So in this case, the number of electrons is the same, but the ability of the molecules to pack together is what's also going to determine the strength of London dispersion force. That's not going to come up very often, but if you see a problem like this where you have two molecules that have identical or very similar formulas, but the shapes are very different, which would be drawn out for you in, in this context, you can predict that the one that's sort of a longer chain, a flatter chain, would be the one that's easier to pack together and have higher London dispersion forces as a result. So the boiling point of this isomer here on the right is much higher than the other one because of that reason. All right, so that's a little bit of an aside, but there, like I said, there might be one or two homework questions where that concept comes into play. But the major one is the idea that heavier atoms and molecules, those that have more electrons, are able to polarize more and have stronger London dispersion forces. So this one is, is a pretty straightforward example problem. Rank the halogen molecules from lowest to highest melting point. So the halogens are that second to last column of the periodic table, and they all appear as diatomic molecules, X2. And so that's gonna be, I guess I should go to the periodic table and I just assume that you know what I'm talking about. I gotta find it. I haven't used the periodic table in a while. All right, so halogens we're talking about, we just finished talking about noble gases, which are these ones here in the last column. And then halogens we're talking about the second to last column here, okay? So that's going to be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, ion. We'll ignore acetine, it's radioactive, so we don't really study it as much anyway. But uh, the first four are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And as this problem says, and as we should know now, because we learned about standard states of elements in chapter seven, all of these are diatomic. So F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, they're all the same shape. They're all linear diatomic molecules. And as we just learned, the ones that have stronger intermolecular forces are gonna have higher melting points. Um, and so the only type of intermolecular force these have are going to be those London dispersion forces, or just sometimes called London forces, and those are going to be stronger in the heavier elements. So again, when you're comparing elements especially, it's as simple as just ranking them from lightest to heaviest. So fluorine is going to have the weakest intermolecular forces and thus have the lowest melting point. Chlorine is next. This is the order they come on the periodic table, the ones from lightest to heaviest, bromine and then iodine. So it's as simple as that. And this also sort of is reflected in the states of matter that these substances occupy under normal conditions. So we talked about standard states of elements in chapter seven. And if you recall, fluorine and chlorine are both gases under standard states. So they would have relatively weak intermolecular forces and be in the gas phase. Bromine is a liquid, it has stronger IMF, so it packs together more as a liquid. Iodine is a solid, it has the strongest London dispersion forces and thus exists as a solid, even at sort of room temperature. So you can see that also in the, in the standard states of these, how the intermolecular forces impact that as well. All right, so any, any questions on London dispersion forces?
All right, so the next type of intermolecular force we're going to cover are dipole-dipole forces. And just to give you a, a, an idea, these are around 1% as strong as bonds. So we talked about co covalent bonds and bond strengths earlier in the course. We use them in chapter seven to calculate delta H, all that stuff. And so we know the values for those. And these are about 1% of that value. So they're, again, much weaker than a typical bond when you're talking about these intermolecular forces. But dipole-dipole forces are stronger than, um, than London dispersion. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But basically, any molecule that has a, that's polar is going to have dipole-dipole forces. So any polar covalent substance polar covalent molecule, if you have two or more of them together, they're going to interact via these dipole-dipole forces. Um, and so this is going to be, now we're talking about permanent dipoles. So in these molecules that are polar, as we talked about, you have a sort of permanent unbalanced electron density. You have more electronegative atoms on one side, less on the other side, and that dis distorts the electron distribution, and that leads to this permanent polarity, and then these are going to exhibit dipole-dipole forces. So one thing we have to keep in mind, just like we talked about back in chapter four, is that compounds that are going to have dipole-dipole forces must have net polarity. So we talked about in chapter four how to predict whether a molecule is polar or not, and it has to be a polar molecule to exhibit dipole-dipole forces. It can't just have polar bonds. Because as we said, sometimes it's, it's, it's possible to have polar bonds in a molecule, but the molecule itself is still nonpolar because those bonds are equally distributed around the central atom. So you need to talk about, we're talking about molecules that are net polar, that have a dipole moment, we're talking about dipole-dipole forces. So the way that this works then is one of the simplest polar molecules is HCl. Two different atoms, two different electronegativity values, so you have an unequal distribution of charge. We indicated that before as a delta minus and delta plus. And the difference here is that there's not an average symmetric distribution of electron density in this molecule like there is for something nonpolar. This one, the average density is unsymmetrically distributed because you have a higher electronegativity, so it's a permanent dipole. It's always going to be polar, even on average, over, over periods of time. And so then what happens is that these molecules, with their partial positive and partial negative charge, they line up with other molecules that are oriented in the opposite direction so that those opposite charges can attract to each other. So you'd have another molecule that's arranged like this, where, again, the partial negative is on, on the left, partial positive on the right, and those opposite charges are now able to interact with each other. So we're going to draw, with the blue lines, we're going to draw the attractive forces, the attractions between the molecules. They can also do sort of a head-to-head -head interaction. So this delta minus chlorine can interact with partial positive from another hydrogen nearby. So you can have interactions like that. Same story down here. And so they have this sort of network of interactions. And the, you know, especially in the liquid phase, the structure of that the, these take on is sort of complex and hard to predict. But basically it involves setting up these forces of attraction between the opposite ends of the dipole in each molecule. So each HCl has a positive and negative pole to it. And lining up the opposite sides allows them to attract each other. Now when you do this, you're also going to force some repulsive interactions as well because you have you know, the, the like dipoles, delta positive, delta positive, are going to repel each other. Delta negative, delta negative, are going to repel each other. Same story in this direction. So you have all these repulsive interactions as well. But the molecules are basically going to arrange themselves to maximize the attractions and minimize the repulsion. So these repulsive interactions are further away when I, when I draw the molecules like this. So they are going to be weaker. So there is attraction and repulsion, but the attractive forces are going to win out. The molecules are going to arrange themselves such that the attractions are as strong as they can possibly be, the repulsions are as weak, and in that you're going to have attractions between the molecules that are called dipole-dipole forces. All right, so it is fairly complex if you start thinking about all the possible interactions, but in net, it's an attraction because of the opposite dipoles lining up with each other. So that's what dipole-dipole forces refer to. Um, and then the last type of intramolecular force we're going to talk about that's relevant to this chapter is really just a special type of dipole-dipole force. So it follows the exact same pattern that we just talked about. You have polar molecules, positive dipole, negative side of the dipole, they line up with each other. But there's a special type that's called a hydrogen bond. Um, 
And this, confused, this, this terminology is a little bit confusing because it's not actually a chemical bond. It's still an intermolecular force, but it's, it's termed as a hydrogen bond. So these are much stronger than typical dipole-dipole forces. These can be around 5 to 10% as strong as a chemical bond. So basically a hydrogen bond is still just a dipole-dipole force, but it's a particularly strong one that exists in certain compounds. We'll talk here in a second how to predict when this would occur. So it's just a particularly strong dipole-dipole interaction. So it's not fundamentally different in any way. It's just a particularly strong one that can occur sometimes. All right, so when do you have hydrogen bonds? It's when anytime you have a molecule that has one or more of these bonds in it, an HF bond, which would just be HF itself, um, where you have partial positive, partial negative that way. If you have an OH bond, one or more OH bonds, or if you have an NH bond, or one or, or more than one. So in all of these bonds here, what you have is hydrogen bonded to a very electronegative element. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine are the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table. So when you have hydrogen bonded to one of those, you have a really strong dipole, a really strong separation of charges. And on top of that, hydrogen is really, really small. So it's able to pack together really close to other dipoles. And so that close packing that's allowed because of how small hydrogen is makes that a particularly strong force. So it's a combination of how polar these bonds are with hydrogen and also how they're able to pack closely together because hydrogen is so small. So compounds that would have this would be, well, HF itself, that's really the only one that has an HF bond. Water, two OH bonds. Methanol, another polar substance that has an OH bond or ammonia, NH3. So these substances that have one or more bonds between hydrogen to either oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine are going to have hydrogen bonds. Now again, we don't want to be confused by the terminology here. If we have two water molecules interacting with each other, again, it's going to be sort of a complex network. But if we have two water molecules arranged like this, this here, the bond between oxygen and hydrogen is not a hydrogen bond. What we have is, what the hydrogen bond would be, would be this sort of intermolecular force here. This would be our hydrogen bond. Where again, you have a partial positive on hydrogen, partial negative on oxygen, and they line up and attract to each other, so that would be called a hydrogen bond. It's a bond between two different water molecules. The OH bond itself is not the hydrogen bond. That's the covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen, but it's not called a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is this intermolecular force between two different molecules, and again, it's just a particularly strong dipole-dipole force because hydrogen is so small, these two can get really close to each other, and that makes that interaction pretty strong. All right, so any questions on, on those different forces and that one in particular? Yeah. Yes, we're going to talk about that later on. So other properties of liquids that you may have heard about before, um, surface tension, viscosity being the two big ones we'll cover in this class, are all related to the intramolecular forces also. Yes. All right. Um, now the last type of force I'm going to cover, it's not, I don't think it's really going to come up in this course too much because it, it only is going to, um, it's going to involve mainly mixtures. So the first one, not so much. But there are other forces that involve ions. And whether you classify this as an ionic bond or an intermolecular force is kind of arbitrary, I would suppose. So we're not really going to call it an intermolecular force necessarily. But I just want to quickly introduce that there are other types of forces like this that do involve uh, charge you know, positive or negative charge ions. So ion-ion forces, which are sometimes just called ionic bonds, again, we called them that before, and so they're not really an intermolecular force, they're more like an ionic bond, but these are gonna hold ions together in ionic crystals. 
And again, it's not really an intermolecular force, it's more like a, a typical bond. But what you have is, you know, a positive ion, a negative ion. And because they're both charged, you have this really strong force between them, which would be called the ionic bond. Now, as we'll learn later on in this chapter, very, very much towards the end, when you have an ionic crystal, you don't just have two atoms bonded together and that's the only interaction they have. These sort of ionic interactions go in all directions. So you'll have this sodium will be surrounded by a bunch of other chlorides that are going to interact with it in the same way. This chloride sort of separate, sort of surrounded in all directions by sodium. So again, it's, it's sort of a complex network. It's not just a single interaction between two ions that's responsible for holding it together, but it's going to be classified more as an ionic bond. Now the other type that you'll talk about more if you take the Chem 1312, the second semester of this course, are called ion dipole forces. We're not actually going to see these in this chapter because they only occur in mixtures. And this chapter is all about pure substances, so, so um, you know, just a single component. But when you start talking in, in chapter 10 of this book, which you'll cover at the beginning of, of Chem 2, you have when you have an ionic compound dissolved in water, which we've talked about a lot in this course in chapter 6, you have what are called ion dipole forces. So these are going to be interactions between polar molecules, which is usually your solvent if you have an ionic solution, and the ions that would be dissolved in that. So again, the classic case where you'll see these is in aqueous solutions. So we have a little bit of a concept of this already from chapter six. When you dissolve an ionic compound in water, it separates into the ions. So if you have water, which has you know, dipoles arranged like this, and that can interact with the positive ion through the oxygen. And then when you have, we showed a video of this at the very beginning of chapter six that kind of explained this in video form. Another water molecule, partial positives, can interact with the negative ions, the chlorides. So these are called ion dipole interactions because you have an ion that's dissolved in solution typically interacting with the dipole of the molecule that's dissolving it. So we're not going to really talk about this in this course because we don't talk about solutions in chapter 9, but just so, just for completeness and just so you don't think I was hiding things from you when you take Chem 2, this is another type of intermolecular force, but only occurs in mixtures when you have an ionic compound dissolved in a polar substance like water. Um, and we're, you'll talk about in Chem 2 how these types of forces influence, influence the, um, the properties of the solution, the properties of the water change when it has ionic compounds dissolved and all that stuff's going to come up later on. But for this part of the course, you can almost ignore this slide here because we're only going to talk about really in context these th previous three hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole forces, and London dispersion forces. Those are the three that we really need to know to understand how um, these forces work in pure substances. So now that we've covered all three of them, let's talk about the final ranking of them in terms of how strong they are. So this is the, probably the most important thing to remember in addition to how to predict them is you know, the, the final ranking. So if you have London dispersion forces, again, those are called London dispersion forces, but sometimes just London dispersions, sometimes just dispersion forces, any combination of those three words kind of means the same thing. So London dispersion is the weakest. Dipole dipole is in the middle. And then hydrogen bond is the strongest. So of those three main IMFs, intermolecular forces that occur in pure substances, liquids or solids that just have a single component, especially if they're co covalent substances, which is mostly what we'll talk about in this first part of the chapter, this is going to be the ranking of the intermolecular forces. And so now what you're able to do is if you can predict what types of intermolecular forces something has, that can allow you to make predictions about boiling point, melting point, and then a couple other properties that we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so that's the final ranking, and that's how that's the order in which they would come in from weakest to strongest, and that's important to understand as well for being able to predict this. So let's use all these concepts in, let's see how many, well just one sample problem here. So we have the molecules carbon dioxide, CO2, and then carbon monoxide monosulfide, COS, where we just replaced one oxygen with a sulfur, 
which one has the higher boiling point. So whenever you're comparing substances in terms of melting point or boiling point, you want to be able to identify the strongest intermolecular force that they have, because that's going to be the one that is the key determinant of those properties. So you figure out what the strongest intermolecular force is, and if one of these two has stronger intermolecular forces than the other, you would expect it to have a higher boiling point. So for CO2, we have to predict whether both of these are polar or nonpolar first. That's kind of, we know there's not going to be hydrogen bonding because they don't have hydrogen in the formula, so there's no OH or NH bonds to worry about. But we have to predict if they're polar or nonpolar to be able to understand whether they only have London dispersion forces or whether they also have dipole dipole forces. So for CO2, what we get is a linear molecule. and it's gonna be AX2 E0 if you like that notation. But however you choose to remember it, it's a linear molecule, no lone pairs on the central atom, and so the two dipoles cancel out. You have a delta minus over here, two delta plus in the center, but they're opposite in direction, so they cancel each other out. So CO2, as we, as we talked about well before, earlier on in the course, is a nonpolar molecule. It's a linear molecule, and the two CO dipoles cancel each other out, so it's nonpolar. Anything that's nonpolar, like CO2, is only going to have London dispersion forces. So the strongest and really the only intramolecular force in carbon dioxide is going to be London dispersion. So now we have to figure out what happens in COS and decide does that have stronger or weaker intermolecular forces. And so if we draw COS, it's still going to be linear. But this time what happens is we don't have two equal dipoles in the opposite directions. We still have the same carbon oxygen dipole that we did before, but carbon and sulfur have much more similar electronegativity values. I think sulfur is like a little bit more electronegative than carbon, but they're really close. And so you'll just have a really small dipole in that direction. So this time the dipoles no longer cancel each other out because as we sort of framed it in chapter four, there's two different outer atoms here, the oxygen and the sulfur. They don't have the same electronegativity value, so the two dipoles are not the same anymore, and so they don't cancel each other out. And so this molecule is gonna have a net dipole pointing towards oxygen, because oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. So because this molecule has a net dipole, this is gonna be a polar molecule, and that means then the strongest intermolecular forces in this are not going to be London dispersion forces, but it will also have the dipole-dipole forces. So both of these will have London dispersion forces, but in COS, it's also going to have dipole-dipole forces. Dipole-dipole forces are stronger than London dispersion forces, so we would expect the intermolecular forces to be stronger for COS, and because they're stronger, we would predict that leads to a higher boiling point. All right, so that's how we kind of make these types of predictions. We have to think about the strongest intermolecular force. Now, if, if the two have the same types of intermolecular forces, then you have to, within that type, rank which one is stronger or weaker, like we did earlier for London dispersion forces. But in this case, two different types of forces, dipole-dipole forces are stronger, so that's gonna dominate and lead to a higher boiling point for that substance. I don't know off the top of my head, but I think COS is a liquid at room temperature, CO2 is, is not. So you can see that there's a pretty big difference there based on the state of matter that they, that they would take on at normal conditions. All right, any questions on that? All right, so in addition to boiling point and melting point, we're now going to talk about a couple other properties of liquids that depend on these intermolecular forces and that are sort of dictated by them. Um, so we're talking about surface tension, capillary action, adhesive forces, cohesive forces, different things. Okay. So surface tension is defined as the resistance of a liquid to increase its surface area. And that's kind of a, maybe a weird definition, but um, we kind of know what it means, I think, in general terms, which is that a liquid surface, particularly water, which has pretty high surface tension, But a liquid surface is gonna have really an upper bound to it. And at the top of that liquid, there's gonna be some resistance to spreading that liquid out. So that's why if you've ever seen videos of those insects that can sort of like walk on water, um, it's because of that surface tension of the liquid that opposes their, the weight of, the, of the, the, the very small weight of the insect. And that allows them to sort of walk on the water and not sink in like, like a normal object would. So surface tension is responsible for that. Um, 
and uh, it's it's also the reason why you know if you put if you put water in a glass, it sort of has that nice defined upper surface and doesn't just like spread out everywhere because of that tension at the top. Now the reason that a liquid has surface tension, probably not important, but if in case you're wondering why does this even occur, it's because all the molecules in liquid have these intermolecular forces between them. Um, but the liquids at the surface, they only have molecules below them. They don't have any molecules above them because they're at the top. And so those intermolecular forces for those very top surface molecules are in that pulling it down. Um, so most, you know, most molecules in the bulk of, this, of, the, of the liquid have molecules surrounding in all directions. Those forces are sort of equal in all directions. But at the very top of the liquid, there's no molecules above them. So the net pull is in the downward direction and that keeps that top surface sort of well-defined. And stops it from just you know evaporating off and, and you know changing shape all the time. So that's what surface tension is caused by. It's the resistance of a liquid to increase its surface area. Now a sort of related concept that involves surface tension, but it has a, a slightly different behavior associated with it, is called capillary action. So capillary action is the spontaneous rising of a liquid. in a glass tube. So this is kind of, so if you have a really thin glass tube and you put it in water, you'll see the water will start to rise up the tube, uh, you know, seemingly defying gravity. Or if you just look at a tube of liquid and you look really closely at the surface, it's not usually totally flat. It's usually going to sort of buckle up on one side or buckle down. And we'll talk about the different reasons for that here in a little bit. So what causes this capillary action, what causes a liquid to rise up the tube or to not have a totally flat surface when it's in a glass tube is a competition between two forces, adhesive and cohesive forces. So adhesive forces are the force of attraction between the liquid and the container. And why this is significant is because the surface of glass is polar. So glass is a mainly a silicon dioxide compound, silicon and oxygen are the main elements, but it has a lot of hydroxide groups, OH groups on the surface of it. And so those OH groups are polar because you have a hydrogen bonded oxygen, so you have that dipole. So you have a polar surface in liquid. And so what basically happens with adhesive forces is that the polar molecules, if they are polar like water, are going to have attractions between the surface of the glass. They're going to be attracted to the surface of the glass because they're also polar. Um, and then the other force that you have to counterbalance that with is called the cohesive forces. And these are going to be the actual intermolecular forces of the liquid itself. This is kind of a synonym for intermolecular forces in some level. And so whenever you put a liquid into a glass container, wherever the liquid meets that glass container, wherever that boundary is, there's going to be a competition between two forces. The, the cohesive forces, which are pulling the liquid molecules together, and then the adhesive forces, which is the liquid being attracted to that surface. And so that can lead to two different situations when you put um, a glass into a salt, into, into a, into, sorry, liquid into a glass container. So the first is if you have a convex vortex. That's where it sort of buckles down like this. It's lower on the sides of the glass. In this situation, this occurs because the cohesive forces are stronger than the adhesive forces. Sorry. I ran, let me write this a little bit differently. I'm going to run a room. So cohesive forces are stronger than adhesive forces if you have a convex vortex. That means the liquid molecules are drawing each other in more strongly than the liquid is being drawn up the glass, okay? So this is typically going to happen if you have a nonpolar liquid. Because in nonpolar liquids, you don't have strong attractions between the molecules and the polar glass surface, and so the interaction of the molecules with themselves went out. But if you put water into a glass container, this is what it will look like. It's called a con concave vortex, and this is when you have stronger adhesive forces. So when the adhesive forces are stronger than the cohesive forces, basically the liquid is going to be more strongly attracted to the glass, so it's going to start rising up the side a little bit and cause this concave shape, this, this shape where the liquid is higher on the sides. 
and that happens when you have a polar liquid. All right, so that's, that's sort of a consequence of capillary reactions because of the attraction between the molecules of the liquid and the, the surface of the glass, and depending on which of those is stronger, that's gonna dictate whether the vortex, the surface of the liquid is either convex or concave. Okay, so those are some properties of the liquids. Yeah? So for the adhesive force of adding to it, if you have like a non polar substance because water is like a hot water, you have to take it out. So if you have a non polar substance with water? So like like, let's say you have like a glass. Oh, yeah. So if you have nonpolar glass, then you would get a convex vortex for water. So you can do that with regular glass. There's ways of functionalizing the surface with um, usually like hydrocarbon chains. You basically replace all the hydrogen atoms on the surface with hydrocarbons, CH, you know, C2, or CH2, blah, 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 and make it really, make it really nonpolar. And then you would have the exact opposite situation. So a polar liquid would probably have a convex and a non-polar liquid would be concave. But regular glass is polar, so this is how the behavior would be in, in normal glass that you, would, that you would see in your everyday life. All right, anything else? All right, so the other property we're going to talk about is called viscosity. Um, and so viscosity is defined as the resistance to flow. But the sort of simpler way to think about it is viscosity refers to how thick a liquid is. Um, and really all of these properties that we're talking about, surface tension and now viscosity, are going to always have, they're going to have higher surface tension or you're going to have higher viscosity whenever the IMFs, the intermolecular forces, are stronger. So they all correlate directly with the intermolecular forces. So the ones that have stronger intermolecular forces have higher viscosity. So these, these pictures here kind of show you. The, the blue liquid on the left would have relatively low viscosity. It pours out nice and easily. This one on the right is high viscosity, showing that it doesn't pour out. It's really thick and pours very slowly. So, you know, water has relatively low viscosity. We know we can pour that easily, but if you ever work with, you know, motor oil additives or syrup, I guess would be an example of something that has high viscosity and that, that flows really slowly is really thick as a liquid. So that's the different properties of liquids related to how, how they flow. So as an example, if we want to predict which of these liquids has the highest viscosity, we just need to find the one that has the strongest intermolecular forces. One thing that's going to be helpful to remember in this part of the course is that um, whenever you have a hydrocarbon compound, a compound that just has carbon and hydrogen in the formula, without even thinking about its shape or anything else, you can predict that it's going to be nonpolar. Anything that's a hydrocarbon is nonpolar, and that's because all the carbon atoms are tetrahedral, all the dipoles cancel each other out. Moreover, the, the electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen are pretty similar to each other, so the individual bonds themselves aren't very polar either. So anything that's just carbon and hydrogen you can assume is going to be nonpolar, and so that means the strongest intermolecular force in this compound here, this is pentane, which I did talk about earlier, C5H12, this is the, the linear form, the strongest intermolecular force, the only intermolecular force, would be London dispersion. Now if we go to um, this molecule here, we see that there's an oxygen in the center. And so if we were to draw this one out in a little bit more detail, this one is kind of like water, but it has just two hydrocarbon chains on either side instead of hydrogens. But it's going to have a bent shape. But there are no bonds between oxygen and hydrogen, so it's not going to have hydrogen bonds because all the bonds involving hydrogen are to carbon, but it is going to be a bent-shaped molecule where you have an electronegative oxygen atom at the, at, at the top there, so this would have dipole-dipole interactions. So this, was, this is going to be a polar molecule, so it would have dipole-dipole interactions because it has the oxygen in the center which is going to be more electronegative than carbon and lead to an unbalanced of charge. And then finally, if we go to this last one here, without even drawing out the structure, we see that it has two OH groups in the formula. So anytime you have a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, or nitrogen and fluorine as well, this gives rise to hydrogen bonding interactions. So hydrogen bonding interactions are the strongest, and so this one would have the strongest intermolecular forces. And because it has the strongest intermolecular forces, you would predict that it has the highest viscosity. Um, and this substance here is called propylene glycol, and 
This substance or very similar ones are used in antifreeze. Again, not something that we use a lot here in Texas, but the, the liquid that you can put into your car to stop the engine from freezing is this really thick liquid that lowers the, the, the temperature at which water freezes inside of there. And anyway, this is one of those substances that has really thick, high viscosity. These ones are really low viscosity, comparatively speaking. All right, so anytime you're predicting a property like viscosity or surface tension, it's directly related to how strong the intermolecular forces are. Find the strongest intermolecular force that would give you, in this case, the highest viscosity. We would also predict that this has the highest surface tension as well uh, for the same reason. All right, so any questions on that? All right, so the last thing we're going to cover today is called vapor pressure, um, which is related to sort of the, the conversion of a liquid into a gas. And we talked about vapor pressure a little bit in Chapter 8. We had those problems where you collect a gas over water and you had the vapor pressure of water that you had to account for. Um, so that came up a little bit, but now we're going to formally define it and talk about the factors that influence it. So vaporization is the process of converting a liquid into a gas. We said that boiling and vaporization can kind of both be used to describe this process. It just depends on the, the, the context, really. They don't, they don't mean anything terribly different from each other. Um, but when something vaporizes, that's when a liquid converts into a gas. Now, all of these phase changes, we're going to get into this more next time with the other ones, but every phase, phase change we have, liquid to gas, gas to or, uh, sorry, liquid to gas, liquid to solid, and so on, they all have an enthalpy change associated with them. Um, and so the enthalpy of vaporization is the delta H that's associated with vaporizing one mole of a substance. All right, because if we're going to vaporize a substance, we have intramolecular forces between the molecules and the liquid, we have to break those intermolecular forces in order for the molecules to separate and go off into the gas phase. So you have to put energy into it to break those. And so that's called the enthalpy of vaporization is the enthalpy change that's required for that. So delta H of vaporization is the enthalpy change associated with vaporizing one mole of a substance. Usually one mole is how it's defined. And because we have to break intermolecular forces to vaporize something, we always have to put energy into the system to vaporize it, which means that this enthalpy of vaporization is always going to be endothermic, a positive value. All right, so that's the enthalpy change associated with that, called delta H vaporization, enthalpy of vaporization. Um, now, the, the reverse process of vaporization is called condensation. This is where we go from gas to liquid. Molecules in the gas phase become a liquid, condense back into a liquid. And so this is the exact opposite process. Vaporization is liquid to gas. Condensation is gas back to liquid. And so the enthalpy change for this is just the opposite negative of the enthalpy of vaporization. So the delta H of condensation is negative delta H of vaporization. Again, think of things we learned back in chapter 7. If you reverse a reaction, you change the sign of delta H. That's all we're doing here. We're reversing the process, and so we just change the sign of delta H. Same value, just opposite in sign. Um, and this is always an exothermic process as a result, which um, I wouldn't recommend this activity, but if you ever held your hand above a pot of boiling water and the steam from the water, the gas, you know, the vapor condenses on your hand, uh, you know that that feels hot, right? Because that's the, the molecules are transferring heat to the surroundings, an exothermic process whenever condensation occurs. So this is a, a, an exothermic process, just the opposite of the sign for delta H of vaporization, same value, opposite in sign. So that's kind of the enthalpy changes associated with it, but let's talk about then what causes vapor pressure. So if you have a liquid in a closed container, you're always going to have some molecules that are in the gas phase above that liquid that cause a pressure. Again, we introduced that a little bit in chapter 8. And so what, how, how this sort of happens is that when you first put the liquid in the container, at the very beginning there's no molecules in the gas phase, but at first there's going to be net vaporization. 
Yeah, surface molecules escape. So when you first put the liquid in, this is the beginning of this process. You first put the liquid into the container. Initially, all the molecules are in the liquid phase, but some portion of molecules at the very surface of the liquid have enough energy to escape into the gas phase, and that's what gives rise to vapor pressure. So at the beginning, you're going to have you know, net evaporation as molecules escape the surface, and that's going to cause the vapor pressure to rise. But eventually, you're not going to just keep rising the vapor pressure forever. Eventually, you're going to get to a situation where you get to a constant vapor pressure. So eventually, a constant vapor pressure is established. And we'll abbreviate vapor pressure as PVAP for vapor pressure. And that is because when you get to this what's called equilibrium state where the vapor pressure is constant, what's happening is you have some molecules now in the gas phase that are sort of floating around and giving rise to that vapor pressure, but then at the surface of the liquid you have both evaporation and condensation happening at the same, same rate. So basically there's no more net evaporation. So once you get enough molecules in the gas phase, some of them are then going to periodically recondense into the liquid, and you basically get to a situation where the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are, are the same as each other, so there's no change in pressure anymore because you have the same molecules in the gas phase at any time. So the way this kind of looks in a graphical picture, if you like graphs, what I'm going to show here in blue is the, the vaporization rate. Now that's actually constant, so at any given time, you're going to have the same number of molecules escaping into the gas phase. The, rate, the vaporization rate is constant and is a function of temperature, but then the condensation rate is going to be what initially increases. So I'm going to show that in red here. And the reason that this one increases is because at first you don't have any molecules in the gas phase. You don't have any molecules that can condense. As you start vaporizing molecules and some of them go into the gas phase, some of them recondense back to the liquid. And so that is going to increase until the condensation rate and the vaporization rate are the same as each other. So again, blue is going to be vaporization. Red is condensation. And those two rates are eventually going to be the same as each other. And when you get to that point, you have a constant vapor pressure. Same number of molecules are going into the gas phase as condensing. So there's no net change in how many gas phase molecules you have. So that's a little bit of more of a detailed picture of what causes vapor pressure. Anytime you have a liquid in a closed container, there is going to be some pressure of that vapor above the liquid. What we're going to also talk about now is how we measure it. We have we might run out of time not to do everything today, but we'll, we'll keep going for now. So how do we measure with a barometer? So the way that we measure vapor pressure is we first have to measure the atmospheric pressure. I should probably take this slide out because you probably, but some of you might care how we measure it. Most of you probably don't. Um, not particularly important for homework questions, but you first measure the atmospheric pressure with a barometer. So this is what you do first. You have a barometer. So from chapter eight, we learned that a barometer is just a pan of mercury usually with a tube inverted in it. And so you measure the, the height of that liquid, which at sea level is about 760 millimeters of mercury. And then initially what you have is just a vacuum up here, no gas up here. And you're just measuring the atmospheric pressure pushing down on that surface there, okay? So that's what you have initially. And then what you do is you inject a liquid into this top empty part here. 
So we're going to add the liquid to this top part here. So it's going to be the same barometer. But what it's going to have now is same tube. But now you're going to have liquid up here. So the vapor pressure from the liquid is going to be up here. And it's going to be pushing down on the column. And the opposite direction is the atmospheric pressure. And so then the mercury column is going to get lower because it has vapor pushing down on it in the other direction. So it's basically two opposing forces. Atmospheric pressure forcing the mercury up the tube, vapor pressure forcing it down. Those two kind of compete with each other. And that changes the height of the column here. So you're going to measure the new height of the column there, H. And so here's an example of how this would work. If we assume that the atmospheric pressure is exactly 760 millimeters, and then the height of this column is going to be the atmospheric pressure minus the vapor pressure. So however much um, this height changes, is going to give us what the vapor pressure would be. So if you have water at 25 degrees Celsius, you would measure a height of 736 millimeters after you've added the water to the top. So basically this starts at 760, you add the water, I exaggerated how much it dropped, and it would drop to 736, it would drop by 24 millimeters, which is only like one inch, basically. Um, but the new height is lower than that, and so then that means the vapor pressure is the atmospheric pressure, which is 760, minus the new height, which is 736, which comes out to 24 millimeters of mercury. So the vapor pressure of water at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, is 24 millimeters. And that's just a little bit of a background of how you would measure it. Again, not terribly important for this course, but I just wanted to quickly show that that's a very low-tech way of measuring vapor pressure using a barometer, a device that we already introduced back in Chapter 8. But the more important for us, thing for us to understand, both conceptually and a little bit numerically, is how does the vapor pressure change with temperature? So I just said that the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius is 24 millimeters of mercury. But if you measure at any other temperature, it's going to be different than that. It does depend on temperature. So what we're going to look at here is sort of a, a, a graphical picture that helps us understand how vapor pressure changes with temperature. Um, so our first temperature here, T1, is going to be relatively cold, let's say. So we're going to start with a cold temperature, T1, a lower temperature. And so kind of like gases that we talked about earlier, the molecules in a liquid also have a distribution of energy or velocity. Let's just do it in terms of kinetic energy. So the molecules in a liquid are constantly moving around each other. They're all in contact, but they're sort of rolling around in that liquid. And they're going to have a distribution of kinetic energy. Not every molecule is going to have the same kinetic energy. Some are going to be high, some are going to be low. They're going to have some average. And so they're going to have this distribution here. And so let's say that this value here, I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit more so you guys can see it more clearly, sorry. So let's say that this value here is the, the kinetic energy that the molecules need to escape the surface of the liquid. So when a molecule has enough kinetic energy, it can get off the surface of the liquid, and it can then become in the gas phase and contribute to the vapor pressure. So at this lower temperature here, only this very small portion of molecules that are to the right of that, that have higher kinetic energy than that, have enough kinetic energy to escape the surface. Now, if we go to a higher temperature, a hotter temperature, T2 here, which I'll show in red, same, same axis here, fraction of molecules, kinetic energy on the, on the x-axis. But now when we go to a hotter temperature, we have a greater distribution of kinetic energy values, and they shift to the right. So you're going to have this sort of similar thing that we saw for gases. You're going to have molecules on average have higher kinetic energy. So if this is the value that you need to escape the surface, now you have a lot higher fraction of molecules that have enough energy to escape the surface. So this fraction here has enough kinetic energy to escape. And so based on what I told you here, if you raise the temperature of a liquid, is the vapor pressure going to get higher or lower? There's only two possibilities. You have 50% chance. Higher. Anybody else disagree? 
All right, so I only heard one person answer, but that person was correct. So the higher the vapor pressure does get higher because you have molecules have more energy on average, more kinetic energy, more of them can escape the surface, and if more escape the surface, that increases the pressure above the surface of that liquid. So the key conclusion then is that vapor pressure increases as the temperature increases. All right, so that's the, the key concept then from that. So we're going to introduce then a, an equation for this. I probably won't have time to do the example problem, so I'll pick that up next time. But let's just introduce the equation real quick. Um, really the only equation in Chapter 9 as far as I can remember. So what it is is that the equation is that the natural log of the vapor pressure, so first equation is, of course, that involves ln natural log, that's going to be equal to the negative of the vaporization enthalpy, delta H vaporization, over the universal gas constant R times 1 over T, plus a constant. Now this constant here depends on the substance, so this is not a particularly useful equation because every substance has a different constant for this, although it could be used, and those constants are tabulated for a lot of substances. But that's not a universal constant. That depends on what substance you're talking about. So a more useful form of the equation compares the vapor pressure at two different temperatures and then writes the equation in this way, which is that the natural log of the two vapor pressures, P1 and P2, is equal to the negative of the vaporization enthalpy over R, so that same term out front, times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1 where, again, these are the two different temperatures. So P1 is the vapor pressure at some temperature T1, P2 is the vapor pressure at some temperature T2, and this equation relates those two to each other. So you have to remember there's a negative sign out front, so don't forget about that, and then you have to write it in this order, P1 over P2 and then T2 minus T1. If, sorry, I, I think I messed that up. Um, this form of the equation should not have the negative sign out front, sorry. If you want to keep the negative sign out, you, you, you have to rearrange the order of T2 and T1. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, and so in this equation, temperature has to be in Kelvin. And we have to use the value of R that's 8.314 joules per k-mole. Anytime, anytime we're dealing with energy values like delta H, we use this value of R. So delta H needs to be in joules so that it divides out with the universal gas constant R. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. So this allows us to establish a linear relationship if we put the natural log of the vapor pressure on the y-axis and we say that x is the inverse of the temperature 1 over t, the slope of this would be minus delta h over r and the intercept would be that constant c in the first equation. So this is one way you can measure delta h over r is that you measure the vapor pressure as a function of temperature and you plot it in this way. And so if you have a substance like water, it might have this sort of dependence here. This is all qualitative still. But you see a downward sloping because it's equal to negative delta H over R. If you have a substance that has a lower vapor pressure, let's say diethyl ether, which is that substance we saw earlier with the oxygen in the middle, this has a lower vapor pressure than water, and so its slope would be smaller it would be a, less, a more gradual decrease if you have that substance. So basically the slope of this is going to depend on the vapor pressure. Um, but this equation here is, is one that you might see on the homework assignment, so make sure you're familiar with it. And if you write it in this way, you don't need the negative sign up front, you just have to make sure you switch the temperatures on this side. So P1 over P2 on the left, T2 minus T1 on the right leaves the negative sign out. So you can write it in different ways, but this is a convenient one that doesn't have a minus sign anywhere uh, out front of these terms. All right, so we'll do the example problem for that next time, and we'll uh, continue on with um, some other things about phase changes and liquids.